Hi, I'm Lucy Caldwell and I'm here today on behalf of the Irish Cultural Centre in Hammersmith, London. As part of its remit, the ICC provides a platform for Irish authors to launch, promote and discuss their work. While the ICC enjoys showcasing established authors, it's also very keen to encourage and support new and emerging Irish writers. To do this, the ICC liaises with publishing houses, established authors, creative writing courses and literary agents to produce this online series. The format consists of an established author introducing and interviewing a debut author. For this, the fifth interview in the series, I'm so delighted to, speak, to be speaking to Fiona Scarlett about her debut novel, Boys Don't Cry. It was published last year by Faber and it's newly out this February in paperback. Um, Marianne Keyes has called this novel, um, she said it's beautiful and she said, I can't remember ever reading anything so moving. And Donald Ryan said it's tough and true and sad and hopeful. It really is an unforgettable read. And I do defy you not to cry. <laughs> Fiona, for me, the tears started a few chapters before the end of the book and they just didn't stop even after the book ended. Um, I want to, I read Fiona that this book for you started with a tweet. Am I right? Yeah, so first of all, thanks so much for having me on Lucy and I'm such a massive fan of your work. So this is an absolute privilege to be able to be here and speak to you about my new book. So yeah, it actually, the spark of this book came from, I was scrolling away on Twitter as you do, procrastinating away. And I came across a tweet from a pediatric palliative care doctor in South Africa. And what he had done is he had spoken to children in his care who were dying. And he had asked what they would miss the most when they died or what they enjoyed the most in life and what gave their life meaning. So, of course, it was an incredibly moving tweet, powerful tweet. And what I did after reading that was I opened up the laptop and I wrote the first chapter of um, Boys Don't Cry. And I'd say it's one of the only chapters that hasn't really changed at all. There was it's sort of as is when I wrote it all those years ago. And um, so that's where the spark of the idea came from. And then these characters just started to come to life a bit. Yeah. So the book is told Finn is 12. Um, and his story is intertwined with the story of his elder brother, Joe, um, who's an older teenager. Um, we know right from the beginning, or very close to the beginning, that Finn is going to die. And I wanted to ask you about that decision, because it seems to me that's one of the major decisions in the book. You let us know right from the start, so we know that it's coming. Um, you don't sort of, you know, give us false hope or, or do it sort of halfway through or three quarters of the way through. Was that a conscious decision for you or were you going with instinct? Yeah, it was always going to be that way. Um, so when I started writing the story, it was always with the understanding that the reader would know that he had died very early on. Like it's not a spoiler or anything at all like that. Um, now I did heavily into the editing process. I remember asking my editor, going, oh, am I after making a big mistake here? Like, should I reveal this later on? And she was, no, like this is, this is the book. If I did do that, it'd be a very, very different book. Um, I didn't want it to be like this book is about grieving and love and coping with that. Um, so I think if I had a change that and didn't sort of stick with my gut instinct to keep it that way, it just wouldn't have been the book that um, it is now. Yeah, um, as I said, there are two strands. Finn's is written in the past tense and his brother and that's leading up, you know, the, the, his sort of decline. And then his brother Joe's is written in the present tense. Um, kind of it takes us through what happens afterwards um, and I wondered when you were writing these two voices did you write them together um, or did you write sort of all of Finn and all of Joe and then cut and splice them sort of thing how did that work? Yeah I actually wrote them together I could um, there are two narratives I saw completely together from the beginning I think it would have been for me anyway too difficult to separate them like there's sort of things that happen in Joe's that sort of bounce off in or things that happen in Finn's that bounce off in Joe's and um, so when I was writing the story I always saw it as a together rather than the before and after and there's something I'm writing now at the moment and it's um it's it's not dual narrative it's dual timeline still but it's the same narrator and I did that separately I did all the past and then I worked on the present so I think it depends on the story and what's needed for the story and how you approach writing dual timeline well for me anyway and um, 
yeah. <laughs> uh, was one of the voices harder than the other or what were the, the challenges of each? Yeah, Joe was really, really, really hard to write, really difficult. And actually, um, I always have to have a story sort of in my head. I have to have an idea of where I'm going with it before I write anything. So I don't I don't necessarily plan or write notes or things like that. But I do have to have a lot of thinking time about a story before I start. And originally, I always thought this was going to be between the mother, Annie and Finn. That was who I had in my head that this story was going to be about. But then when I actually sat down to write it, it was Joe that came in straight away. Um, so Finn's narrative was actually much easier to write. And I think it's because it was so inevitable what his story was going to be. Um, but whereas with Joe, he's a really, really guarded character. And I found myself explaining a lot of his actions. I could see a lot of me in Joe's character when I was going through the edits and reading through it and everything. And I suppose like it was like a penny drop moment for me when I heard, um, I always get his name wrong, Andre Ackerman is it who will call me by your name. And I was at an, listening to like a webinar bit similar to this um, between Louisa Joyner and him. And he was talking about in Call Me By Your Name, the characters never actually say I love you. And people have asked him before, why, why don't they say that? And he said they they wouldn't say that that's not something that the character would say but the reader knows 100 percent that they love each other so i found when i heard that it was literally like a light bulb moment i went back through the manuscript and i just pulled all of me all my explanations of why things out of it and um, so i think with writing as well things come to you at certain times when you need it like i needed to see that interview for something to connect up in my brain to say all oh, right okay i just have to let this this character speak for himself and just let him be, you know. It'd be really lovely, Fiona, to hear um, an extract of the story. And I know you're going to read the beginning. You've described this beginning, the first thing that you ever wrote. Um, let's hear it. Great, yeah. So this is the very opening chapter and it's from Finn's perspective. Ice cream. Any flavour, chocolate, banana, strawberry, or that one that has salt tree striped together, sandwiched in a wafer. A screwball from <clears throat> sauce and sprinkles, begging Ma for a euro and legging it down the concrete steps, praying that I get there before you left, following the music box sounds of green sleeves or teddy bears picnic or Yankee doodle dandy. Being pushed in Tesco's trolley around the back of the flats, Joe giving us all a shot, but letting me stay the longest, pushing me faster, spinning and laughing while crashing into the overflowing double steel bins. Mrs O'Sullivan reading Rodal, the witches, the twits, Matilda, out loud, putting on the voices, letting me borrow them after and never asking for them back. My red transformer, the one Dad got me for my birthday, even with its left wheel missing and scraped off face, it was still my favourite. Swimming in the sea at Dollymount Strand, making sandcastles, then kicking them down, poking the washed up jellyfish with a stick and standing on the dead ones. Ma, warming my pyjamas on the bedroom rad, took me in, making sure to plug in my stormtrooper nightlight, always. Joe, flying down Captain's Hill with me in the handlebars. Joe, sneaking me into 15's film at the Plex with plastic bags of popcorn, fizzy worms and coke. Joe sharing his headphones and turning up the volume when Da took chunks out of Ma. I still wish they'd let Da visit. I wish they'd let me home. I wish they'd serve Big Macs here instead of cabbage, mash and ham. Dr. Kennedy said to write it all down. The things I'll miss the most, it's supposed to be part of the process. Help me transition, but trying to fit everything in that's busting out the top of my head is sending me mental. Plus, no one has come out and said it yet. Not the nurses. Not Dr. Kennedy, not Ma. But Joe asked me if I was afraid, and that's when I knew. Gorgeous, thank you, Fiona. You know, I still have sort of goosebumps. <laughs> you know, listening, listening to you, you read that. Um, and when I read it for the first time, it put me really in mind of like, like Van Morrison, "Take Me Back," or you know, one of those sort of litany type songs. And I wanted to ask you, um. I'm going to ask you a lot about feeling, I think, in the course of our conversation, but I wanted to ask you about music and if you see like rhythm as a way of creating feeling um, in that way that I remember listening to Van Morrison and sort of transportative power of that, you know, the accumulation of rhythm and the speeding up of rhythm. It's like a surge or a swell or a rush that sort of 
opens you up as a reader. Um, and so I wonder sort of how important, how consciously you work with rhythm and how important music was to you, because it seemed to me from that opening, it's, it's really important. Yeah, it's practically essential to me. So I've said this before, like I, I'd hear a story nearly before I see it. So the sound is really, really important, how it sounds and the rhythm, like at the rhythm of it on the page um, and the silences as well. So like in music, it's it's the silence is really important just as much as the reading experience, leaving that space for the listener or the reader. Um, and my undergraduate degree is in music and um, my elective was in performance my final elective at the end it was sort of specialized in performance but I was always heavily drawn to composition and um, in my leave insert when I did music I did the composition elective which hardly anybody does so it, I've always been drawn to that sort of creation in music and especially the feelings that music gives so I don't listen to music while I'm actually writing but I heavily listen to it afterwards and there's songs and pieces of music that are I've listened to on repeat in connection with this book and the music that I listen to is all to do with the feeling that I want to try and capture on the page. So, for instance, one of the pieces I listen to over and over again is Jacqueline Dupre's version of Elgar's cello concerto and just watching her play it and the emotion that she gets through her performance of that piece of music. So it sort of transcends the music on the page to this experience, emotional connection experience. Um, another one that I listened to on repeat was Joni Mitchell's Both Sides Now, the original version um, for Finn in particular. And it, for me, with music, it's I always notice the melody and the feeling first. Um, I don't know, is that from being a musician and studying music? But that's it's very rarely that I'll notice lyrics in a in a song until it's connected with me. And then I look up the lyrics and you'll see how hand in hand the lyrics go with the feeling of the piece of music so yeah it would be really important to me yeah yeah do you I know writers have all sorts of like you know superstitious rituals and ways of like getting themselves into the right mood or limbering up would you if you were going to write a particularly difficult song would you sort of psych yourself up by putting on a piece of music and using that to sort of break you open or do, do, does that do you do that ever um it's more in the aftermath I think it's more um like people ask all the time, was I crying when writing this book? And I didn't at all, actually. I only did like very, very um, nearly at, the, I suppose it was the proof stage nearly when I was reading it more as a reader than as a writer. Um, but then after I'd written very emotional scenes, um, I would always unwind listening to the piece of music that, that I wanted to sort of capture the feeling in it. And that's when I'd get really emotional. So it was sort of like, I suppose, trying to get me out of the intensity of it that I'd use it more so than trying to get in. Um, I don't think I really have a process at all. I just sort of grab bits of time when I can. And I always find it really, really hard to get myself sitting down at the page and actually doing the work. And then when you're finished, you're like, OK, it wasn't. Why was I making this out to be such a big, massive thing? But yeah, I find that hard just to psych yourself up to sit down and just open the page and even write a sentence or a word or something just to get started yeah it's so interesting I mean I said I had once to ask you about feeling and I think it's because I think it's one of the things I most value in fiction um you know like I love a book that stretches me intellectually or makes me think um or you know teaches me something but what I love is something that makes me feel and it's really funny I think that my own writing started working um, with my short stories when I started seeing them as almost as spells to conjure up a particular feeling, um, you know, in the way that a pop song might or in the way that a, a piece of music might. And um, I wondered, why do you think we do read books that make us cry? <laughs> what's the, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the sort of, because there is such a pleasure in that. Um, why do you think we do it? Do you know, I don't know. And it's um, it's funny, even with mine, I didn't think it was going to be as emotional as it was because so many people have said to me, oh, your book, it was just so upsetting or, you know, but in a in a good way, I suppose. Like, there's a lot of people who said they've had very similar um, circumstances to in the book and have lost family members in similar ways and they found it cathartic to be able to release, um, to release that feeling 
or that something that you might not have even been able to express. Like I know even after my own dad died, I went to read him with a friend of mine. It was her book, um, a psychological thriller, Call Me By Your Name. Not Call Me By Your Name. Oh, this is terrible. I have to forget <laughs> what the name of the book is. But anyway, in it, she actually contacted me and said, please don't read this because the father in it dies. But for me, I, I love reading about death and I'm drawn to writing about death and um, I always have been uh, enjoy watching things like that that make me cry I cry at absolutely everything as well like I really anything and everything will set me off like my daughter is <laughs> slagging me we'd be sitting there watching MasterChef and she'd be like are you crying again <laughs> I don't know it's a way of safely releasing an emotion I suppose that um, maybe sometimes you feel like you can't um, without having a framework or a reason there. Yeah. It's interesting to me because I was thinking so many of the books that I loved most as a child and as a young reader as well where I was thinking of you know Bridge to Terabithia, um, Charlotte's Web, The Passage in Little Woman where Beth dies. Um, there's sort of some deep need you know to to rehearse or to contain or to allow these emotions um, and I was interested it's children and dying is something that I've thought and written a lot about myself partly one of my sisters is a palliative care doctor uh, um, and so she works with adults I think it it's a particular calling really to work with dying children but when my sister was training to become a palliative care doctor and working in hospices and children's hospices I became fascinated by this and there were a couple of books um I'm sure you know them um Fiona there's one by Myra Bluebond Langer that's out of print, but I think you can pick up copies easily if, if readers are in, if listeners are interested, called The Private Worlds of Dying Children. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, Elizabeth Kubler Ross, her on children and death, you know, she writes a lot, she writes about children as well. And both what I found really interesting is both of those books, they talk about the ways that children approaching death often show maturity far beyond their years or even beyond their knowledge. And one of the things that that both writers say is that children will often try to help prepare their parents by say asking their parents to read aloud you know say Charlotte's Web or one of those iconic passages and it made me think um you know the section that you just read for us Finn knows no one has said anything to him yet but he knows he's going to die and in your book Finn also has a plan for how to help his family after death you know, his brother Joe is a really skilled um, artist and illustrator. I think him doing like these Tom Gates style drawings and cartoons and, you know, and um, Finn has this plan for Joe that this is how they're going to help the family after he's gone. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. Did that come from your research into palliative care and children? Or I know that you have a, a degree in early childhood years and did it come instinctively, you know, that this working through how Finn might deal with dying? Yeah, a lot of it was working with children. So I'm 17 years working in education and the majority of my experiences with early years, so four, five junior infants, um, but I have worked up. And one thing that you see with children again and again and again is firstly is the resilience. They're, they're far more resilient than anyone ever gives them credit for, but also the clarity in which they can see a situation and accept. Um, so exactly what you were saying too, and in reading um, like that and in reading that original tweet from palliative care doctors is that one of the biggest worry is how is my how are my mom and dad going to cope with this and as you said it's that it's nearly like an instinctive thing in a child that preparation which is just mind-blowing because it's that acceptance that is just there and um, so a lot of it is from uh, working with children and seeing, you know, in my career so far, tragedies that can befall now. Thankfully, I've never had a situation where a child has passed away in my class um, or in, in our school. We've had past pupils who have, but we've had children who've had to deal with the death of parents and other tragic circumstances. And a lot of the time it's, the younger children are able to cope with their feelings um, a lot of the time in my experience than maybe an older sibling who's 13, 14, sort of reaching that sort of adolescent stage. Um, 
which has always been really interesting to me as well. And it's that innocence of childhood as well, I think. And I know as well, when my father died, the difference between um, how my daughter was able to cope with it. She was 10 and my son, who was 13, it was very different. Like my daughter wasn't afraid to go in or hold his hand and talk about him and in a nice way, whereas my son wasn't able to do that at all. So it's just now whether that's just different that everybody copes with grief differently. But again, it's that acceptance and I suppose positivity around it as well. You know, it's it's how it's how they're able to just see straight to the heart of something and in, instinctively know what it is that a parent or a sibling or whoever it is needs in that situation as well. Like it's phenomenal. Yeah, and I think it's one of the things that gives um, Boys Don't Cry such, you know, a solution power is that we've got Finn, who's a diamond, who has this clarity. Um, we're seeing, you know, we're seeing his mum crumble and we're seeing, you know, everyone else react in, in different ways and struggle to cope and fail to cope. And But the... the the way that you manage to write Finn, um, it manages to avoid all sentimentality. You know, one of the ways in which um, it, I think it can be hard to write about children and dying is that it can so easily get too sentimental. I suppose sentimentality is, you know, unearned emotion or pushing the emotion too much or something. And I thought it was like time and time again, I, you know, I was making um, all these scribbled pencil notes in the book as I was rereading it before this conversation. Um, the ways in which um, fit, the ways in which you manage for it to be genuinely moving and not sentimental is down to this this sort of almost irreverent approach that Finn is very clear sighted, and um, you're writing kind of very irreverently as well. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about getting like the tone of that right. Yeah, um, like I was very conscious of that as well, that I didn't want it to be like a cheap shot to the reader and to take that sentimentality, sentimentality out of it, leave it there on the page. Um, so I suppose, sorry, I'm losing my train, train of thought now again. What was the question again, Lucy? I'm really sorry. Well, um, the tone, how did you... How did you get the tone right when you were writing Finn's pieces? Did it come purely from kind of like staying on his frequency, him as a character? Um, you know, how did you make sure that you were getting the balance right between, you know, making people cry and going too far? Yeah, so uh, again, and I think one thing is, as from at the beginning when I was talking about when originally I envisioned this story as being between the mother and Finn, and then Joe just came to the fore. And at the time, I didn't really think about it, but it probably was a protection mechanism because as a mother myself, and I had a son at the time, very similar age to Finn, I don't know if I would have been able to write that without um, heavily sentimizing it and without heavily putting myself into that story. And I think for me personally, as a writer, I think one of the most important things you can do is take yourself out of your character um, and I don't think I would have been able to do that if I was writing it from the perspective of the mother the Annie and Finn and I remember listening to Maggie O'Farrell talking about Hamnet and that she had that idea for that book for such a long time but she didn't write it until her son was much older that it could allow her that sort of space and that perspective to write about it without putting yourself too much um in there so I think a lot of it came down to that and a lot of it came down to sort of um as I said with Finn it was easier to write him because and from the beginning from reading that tweet as well about the outlook that the majority of the children had and the things that gave their life most meaning were what we often take for granted like the simpler things in life like eating ice cream or hugging their dog or playing with their favorite toys family time being read to um and then the only worry or concern they had was about their mom or their dad or their family how they were going to cope so it's I think having that at the center of it as well and just making sure that trying to weave that into Finn um, and then because Joe was so guarded and standoffish and not able to accept his grief until near the end and again 
how he accepts his grief is coming from um, the bucket list really of, you know, what, what Finn has set up so that they can have something there to, to help them cope, I suppose. Yeah, I find it so interesting as well that you didn't cry when you were writing it, but you cried when you were reading it as a reader. Because I had, I wrote a play for teenagers and young people um, called Notes to Future Self. That's a young girl who's dying and she's, um, she has a bit of a hippie mum and she believes that she's going to come back as something else. But she, she's sort of saving up all the things she wants her future self to remember, all her most precious memories. And when I was writing that, I didn't cry. You know, I was trying to get the balance right and trying to get the tone right. But I cried every night seeing the actor do it on stage, you know. Um, it's a, it's a funny thing. It'd be lovely to hear another bit. And I know you're going to read from Finn a little bit later. Do you want to, can you introduce the section for us? Yeah, so I chose this section because this is when Finn has been admitted to hospital. So he's just after being diagnosed with um, leukemia and they're running more tests. Um, and it links a little bit with the opening chapter. So I thought it'd be a nice one to do then. So again, it's from Finn's perspective. Dad came in on his own, a stuffed plastic chippy bag swinging at his wrist, rain dripping off his nose and black leather jacket. That jacket was Da. It was in photos all over the flat, him and Ma when they were younger than Joe on the back of a bus and Da in that jacket still. Your Ma's out having a smoke, he said, and sat down at the side of the bed, put his big arms around me and pulled me into his hug. I could hear his heart thump all strong in his chest while the drops from his jacket soaked right to my skin and I hugged him closer to me. You doing all right, bud? Yeah, he asked, breaking away, rubbing my hair, straight back to doing what Da usually did and as quickly as bad, it's as if the hug never happened at all. I wasn't sure, son, what you needed, like he said, dumping the bag's contents all over the bed. But your ma said to make sure there were pyjamas, whatever about anything else. And he shot me a wink and the two of us laughed and I took a good look at what else he had brought. Fizzy colas, potatoes and a big bottle, bottle of Lucasade. Not bad life, but ma would have remembered that I don't like Lucasade and she would have remembered that I preferred salt and vinegar. And she definitely would have brought my DS and games. But then I saw it still trapped in the bag my favourite transformer and sure, man never would have thought of that. I reached on down and pulled him right out and remember the time when I got him, that day at the fun fair with Dama and Joe and the lights of the rides and the big lumps of candy floss spinning on waltzes till we were all nearly sick and then Da winning my transformer in a big game of hoops that he was able to crack even though it was rigged. Oh, look, you've a telly and all, Finny. Go on, budge over there, son. And he hopped up on the bed with his shoes on and all, not even caring about the mud manking up the sheets. He gave the channels a good flick through and settled on RTE News. And not even the news, the thing that's on before it with those long bell yokes where everyone is supposed to pray. Here, Dad, look at this, I said, trying to fill the board and, and push the bed button that made it go up. Dad didn't look too impressed. And I started to wish I had just watched the news and now I thought he was going to bust one. And why did I need to put in? I sure go on now, give us a shot of that, he said. And he grabbed the remote straight out of my hand, smiled at me and showed off his front cracked tooth while pushing the buttons up and down to 90. Hey, Frank, you can't go doing that now. You'll only go and break it, Ma said, coming in through the door. Ah, break it, me hole. Come on, love, get up. But she just stood there looking, arms folded and cross. Come on, Annie, he said, patting the place beside him. I thought for a minute she'd just make us stop, that she'd get us back to watching the news. But instead, she looked at the door, then hopped on up too. Nice one, Annie, Da said, and he squeezed her hand and kissed her cheek. And the three of us huddled right in, breaking the crap out of the bed. No fun fair like, but it would do all the same. Thank you. It's so lovely hearing it. Um, and I wanted, you know, this is such a Dublin book. Um, you know, it's like the da, the, the accents are like pure dub. And I love those, yeah, it's like shut your moan hole, you cheeky wagon, we hoop, breaking our holes, relax the cacks, all of that. It's 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 gorgeous to read. It just kind of leaps off the page. And I wanted to ask you, um, who for you are the great like Dublin writers? Because uh, Joyce, obviously, but it's Roddy Doyle that for me comes to mind here. Um, yeah. I'm such a big Roddy Doyle fan. And, you know, you read him and you're always saying, oh, feck that bottle of wine in the fridge. <laughs> yeah, he's, oh, Roddy Doyle is a massive, massive influence. Um, I absolutely adore his writing and how he captures um, accent. And I remember going into the Molly Museum, like the Museum of Literature in Ireland. It's a couple of years open now. And there was a quote from Kevin Barry on the wall. And myself and my daughter went in for the first time, just I think it was last year. 
And the quote on the wall from Kevin Barry was, oh, I seem to be forever cursed to write in an Irish accent or to write in an accent. And it just really clicked like because I adore the writing of Kevin Barry as well. I adore um, Joan O'Ryan. And I remember reading Joan O'Ryan's A Spin and Heart. And again, it was like another light bulb moment for me because it's the beauty of capturing the language of the everyday of ordinary people um, faced with extraordinary things. So that's what really draws me. And again, when I started writing, I was writing um, sort of little funny stories for my kids and for the kids in school. And it was always very voicey and dialect driven. So, and again, I think it's because I'm drawn to the rhythm of it and the musicality of hearing accent on the page. Yeah, it's funny. Um, David Park says a similar thing that he started writing because he's a teacher as well, secondary school in his case. Um, and he wants to write something for his students to read that was in the language that they would hear, you know, the places that they would know. So it's, yeah, it's really interesting hearing, hearing that from you as well. Those, um, those, those Dublin, you know, languages and those Dublin street scenes. Um, it's such a vivid, your, the, most of the, the book takes place in the jacks, um, the kind of, you know, the, the, the slang term for the housing state sort of project that the characters are, are living in. Um, can you talk a little bit about creating that, the sense of that place and that community? Yeah, so I always, um, in the back of my mind, uh, there was a place in Dublin, Ballymun Towers is what they were called. They were the only tower blocks in um, Dublin. There's other flats, uh, council flats and housing and that, but the Ballymun Towers were the only sort of tower block and they've now since been demolished. And my mother is from Ballymun and I remember constantly passing the flats always and just the that whole area and my father's from inner city Dublin as well and um, and again it was a bit like with Roddy Doyle wanting to capture um a love of an area and a love of a place um and it's sort of so in the back of my mind it was always t- like like an imagined Ballymun nearly um and I suppose I wanted it to be like a love letter to Dublin and sort of didn't want any it to be condescending or patronizing or anything at all like that but that was sort of in the back of my head that area um so like that as well they're sort of on just on the outskirts of the city center very little amenities so the towers were built and there was also sort of abandoned nearly like a shopping center hub built along with it and everything that happened then because of not being developed in the way that it should have been in the first place you know so yeah, it's interesting thinking about, I wanted to ask you about um, <clears throat> you like writing, like working class and fiction, writing these inner city tower block um, characters and lives. Because I was thinking there was um, a brilliant book published earlier on this year, edited by Paul McVeigh called The 32. And it was, it's subtitled An Anthology of Irish Working Class Voices. <clears throat> and there's an, we were talking about Kevin Barry. Um, I have a, a little, there was a little section um, here, if I can find it, the start of Kevin Barry's essay. Kevin Barry's got a brilliant essay in here called The Gatch. And, and you sort of need Kevin Barry's accent for that. And um, he talks about, he says, if I, I'll just read a couple of sentences of this. He says, about a month before I sat my leaving cert in 1987, one of our teachers came in one morning and gave us a talk about our destinies. We were the top streamed class in the school, considered to be the smarter kids, the good workers. But still in all, he said, you're likely to end up in bum office jobs around the town. I remember the phrase exactly, bum office jobs. He spoke for quite some time and he painted a grim enough future. If we didn't watch ourselves, he said, we'd be working in dreary little insurance offices, answering to bosses who'd gone to the Crescent Comp. They'd be no smarter than us, he said, but they'd have gone directly to university while we'd have been doing bookkeeping courses in the tech. He explained that it was systemic. His message passionately delivered was that we should struggle with all of our resources not to be placed in the boxes that were waiting for us. He said our, the limits of our futures were very often set by the limits our families foresaw for us. He'd been watching this play for years, he said, and it made him angry. We were all a bit rattled by this talk. We hadn't seen it coming. And I was thinking when you were writing, you know, there's, um, you write, you sort of don't shy away from the real problems of domestic violence 
and you know the gang warfare and the drugs on this estate you know the grinding poverty the lack of opportunity but it's what shines through is the joy the tightness of the sibling bonds the characters and um, the friendship but most of all just how hard it is for these characters to break out of this you know, cycle these cycles of deprivation and poverty at all and it's so heartbreaking when um the characters are so limited by how you know like the police see them or how the middle class parents see them you know joe um in one of the really heartbreaking bits of in another of the heartbreaking bits of the book um joe's friend sabine is desperate to do a makeup course and so her nana takes a loan from a loan shark um because sabine the loan will be refunded if sabine gets a place and sabine doesn't get a place and so joe to pay off this loan for sabine um deals some drugs to his friends and he tries to pay the loan, he gets into trouble, he tries to pay the loan shark back, but they refuse, he pays them like 600 euro back instead of the original 250. And they say, no, it's not enough. We still need you to do more for us. And you just see how he's sucked in. Um, we see how his father, who's in prison, has been sucked in. And it's, we, you just see how those cycles repeat, which is sort of another layer of heartbreaking in this book. And I wanted to ask, you know, when you're writing these characters from this inner city world, um, it's a world familiar to you a bit. Um, what are your, what do you feel are your responsibilities or your your passions, your concerns? Yeah, so the area that I'm from is um, a real mix. It's, it's got real extreme um, poverty. And then it also has the far end of the, of the spectrum. It has sort of um, real wealth. So I'm from an area called Blanchardstown in Dublin 15. And the community school that I went to was considered the good community school in the area where you had to do an entrance test to get into it in the first place. But basically it was a way of, of filtering out who didn't belong. It's it's crazy. Um, and one of the things that it's reflecting back on it when you're older, one of the things was that an entrance test was there for anybody who came from the wrong side of Dublin 15. So anyone who's on my side of Dublin 15 had to do an entrance test because we weren't in the catchment area, whereas the affluent area of Dublin 15, even though it was further um, distance from the school, was deemed the catchment area. So all this that goes to play and then that was considered the good school because it creamed off who was actually allowed to attend it and who wasn't. And um, there was a big drug problem in the area at the time where I was. There was a criminal gang called the Westies operating out of Dublin 15 at the time. And it was just the lives that you could see and how how family support is massive, but also how even with that support, if you're coming from such um a deprived area where there's no expectation like what Kevin Barry is talking about in that book so my father worked in one of the community schools that was right in the hub of where this gang operated it from and um, himself when he was younger he was given lots of opportunities particularly with music then he went to college himself in his mid-30s to train as a music teacher and sort of given the same opportunities to children that he was working with that he was given himself but I remember him telling me the story before about a child who was sitting, well, a young adult who was due to sit his leaving cert. Um, so it's like A-levels over there, music practical. And there was no sign of him. He didn't show up. So dad, of course, drove around to the house to see what was going on and, you know, to bring him to the school. It had turned out there was no dad on the scene. The mom had overdosed and he was in charge of all his younger siblings. So you're sort of there going that's the privilege of choice you know I didn't have to deal with anything like that growing up but this is what you're talking about and not everybody who lives in a disadvantaged area is disadvantaged um, and I know particularly around cities around Ireland in particular there's a lot of um, postcode discrimination so as soon as they hear where you're from like I get told all the time you don't sound like you're from Hartstown and you're sort of there well what is somebody from Hartstown supposed to sound like like my mother is from Ballymun, which is considered one of the, well, was considered, and again, this postcode discrimination going on, one of um, the most disadvantaged areas in Dublin. Yes, she's a classically trained pianist. So, you know, it's it's all these sort of um, judgments and preconceptions, exactly what Kevin Barry is talking about there. There's a preconception because you are from this area, you go to this school, so therefore this is who you are. 
And I remember hearing the poet Martin Dyer as well talk about going to attend a school. One of his poems um, is on the syllabus for ordinary level, even search English. And he came to the school and the teacher said, well, you're not going in to talk to the ordinary level students because they won't appreciate you. You're going to the honor students. And, you know, it's already it's by saying that, which, of course, he didn't do. But by saying that, you're saying not only are ordinary level students not worthy of listening to a poet on their syllabus speak to them, they're not worthy of being a writer or a poet or pursuing anything um, in that field because you're not worthy of listening to this poet who is actually on your syllabus. So it's the power of words. I think the power of language, the power of words is just so important, particularly if you're working in an environment with young adults or children um, where your words could literally make or break, you know, so it's... um, I think it's really important. Yeah, and the sort of the, the way that things are so stacked against you um, in so many cases. And but in this book, you know, the, the teachers like um Joe, he's in all this trouble with these loan sharks and kind of fighting against getting sucked into his the, the, the sort of criminal underworld. Um, he's grieving his brother, um, his mum has fallen to, to pieces, he's he 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 gets suspended from school. Um, and the teacher comes to his comes to his flat you know and, and tries to offer to help um Finn's teacher as well comes and tries to help when she thinks that the bruises on his arms might be because he's being hurt at home um and so you get the sense as well that um that that there are people who are trying but just the system is so rotten it's yeah. it's not giving these opportunities that these characters need yeah, and again, that was really important to me as well to have that sort of teacher there as um, as actually caring and especially Joe's, I think, because like the way Joe sees it is, oh, well, he's only doing this because he's looking for his, you know, his Irish Times article on how great they are and being inclusive and offering scholarships and all this type of thing. But he actually does genuinely care and want Joe to succeed, but he just doesn't really know how to do it. And I know, again, with with my own father and what he did in the school that he was working for. And just after he died, the amount of messages we got from past pupils was just, it was unbelievable. So I think that's, everybody needs that one person. So that that power of, of being that one person, not the power of being that one person, but just being aware of that what you do and say can make a difference, I think is really important. Yeah, and the book is dedicated to your dad as well, um, and all the all the people he might have touched and helped, um, which is such a such a beautiful thing. Um, I want to ask you, Fiona, about another kind of um, thing that we lack blueprints for, which is uh, writing a motherhood, because I think you know when I started, when I before I had children, I kind of think the only blueprint I had for motherhood was you know pram in the hallway, enemy of art kind of thing. Um, and I think I wondered if you could talk a little about what the challenges are of being a working mother and writer. You know, you've talked about you know, these scraps of time that you have and and what motherhood has brought to your writing. Because um, I think there's that, I think we're a merciful long way from that the great Edna O'Brien having to keep a blackthorn stick by her study door, you know, to beat away intruders. Um, that story, that might be apocryphal, but I always think it's too good to, you know, to, 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 not to say anyway um but it kind of seems the opposite of that you posted this thing on twitter that was so moving there was a letter that your own daughter had posted under your study door when the novel was published um are you able to to share that with us it's um yeah it's bizarre because you just feel so much guilt well i do you feel so much guilt carving out time for yourself and especially for your first book i think like I'm much better at it now because you don't know what you're doing or is anything coming of it or any of these type of things. And I didn't start writing until I was about 35 or 36. Um, so my children were young at the time or whatever. So it was always just grasping those little bit of, bits of time when you could. When they were younger, it was actually easier, I think, because I had more control over their bedtime. So they'd be in bed and I'd write in the evening and I'd still have time to myself at the end to watch a bit of TV or whatever it is. And again, 
and I shouldn't be saying that I'm incredibly lucky to have a really supportive partner, but I think across the board, male or female, you need to have somebody who believes in you and that you can do it. So if I was ever having really bad days, like my husband, will you just go up and write a chapter or go up and write the book? Like it never would have been finished without that support. Um, but you, you just feel this awful guilt that you're taking this time away from your children. And I remember the day before the book was published, yeah, and a note was slid under the door, like it was a picture. My daughter, she's mad into art, like she's um, she loves art and she draws all the time. And she had written this message on it and was all, oh, I love you, mommy, and I'm so proud of you. But the thing that really stuck out for me is like you've worked extra hard. So it was that she could see the hard work that went into having that book published. And like, I can't think of anything better to teach your children than this hard work and resilience and keep at something you know even when you're getting rejected left right and center so it was just that she was able to see that was I think the most moving part of it for me and I remember I did um eminent and creative writing and I did it via distance learning like that because I was working and I wasn't able to take uh time off work you know, bills mortgage all the rest of it and um like I remember we had this exercise where we had to write a bio and we had to share it with the group or whatever. And in my bio, I had, you know, I had a mother or whatever. And just a young female mother, um, as it said, oh, take out that you're a mother. It's demeaning you and diminishing your work. And at the time, it, it, like not a lot of things would sting or get to me, but that really, really stuck with me for a long, long time. And I kept thinking, oh, is it diminishing my work? Oh, this is terrible. And, you know, male writers would never have their father in there. And why am I doing this? Um, and then it took a long time, but I'm actually proud of being a mother and achieving this um, because no matter what anybody says, the majority of caring responsibilities um, will fall to a mother. It's you know, even calls from school like my husband is a teacher and he works right next door to my children's schools and if there's ever anything um you know where the school has to call they always ring me even though they know he's right next door it's this ingrained society societal thing as well and you could go on about it forever but um yeah I think it brings for me personally I think it brings um a lot and I think particularly for the lessons that or as a role model, especially as a working woman, I lo I know myself that all the women in my life always worked. Um, there is it's just something that I've grown up with and independent working women. And again, it's if you're if you're not that that's that's not anything like the amount of times where I hear as well, especially um in teaching or parent teacher meetings, oh I, I'm just uh, housewife when you're there take that just out of it like that is the biggest job that anybody could ever do um so yeah that's that's it and it's so interesting to hear you know you talk about that the, the struggle and the hard work and the rejection as well and I love when you said that it was um a conversation between Louisa Joyner who's your editor at the paper um and another author and um, the Kobe by your name author who um that sort of sparked something for you and I had a similar one that was, um, I'd written my first novel when I was quite young and the second one was such a struggle and I'd written for years and years and it wasn't working and, and I was just thinking maybe it's true that everyone just has one book inside them and no more. And I was trying to, you know, I was waitressing and doing, you know, like all sorts of things and trying to apply for jobs, but I didn't have a, I had sort of gaps in my CV because I'd been writing and I was just, I was sort of sinking further and further into this sort of pit of you know despair and and some family friends um thought I needed a break and they took me to Hay Festival um which kind of might have been the worst thing but I saw Kieran Desai talk and she was so brilliant she talked about how she'd written her first novel which was kind of a slim novel um and then her next novel she said she spent 10 years on it and she ran out of money, she ran out of places to stay, she was sleeping in friends' flats, and then she went home to stay with her own mum, who's Anita Desai, you know, book or shortlisted novel. And she described one morning sitting on her mum's veranda, and she printed out all the pages of her manuscript, and she said they were just blowing away in the wind, 
and she was just thinking this decade of my life is meaningless unless I somehow I gather them all together and start again and do something and then she managed she wrote the inheritance of loss which went on to win the booker and I remember just watching her and I had one of those moments where I thought it was kind of hearing the backside like the messy the backside of it the rejection the struggle and I remember thinking if she can do that and bring herself back maybe I still can and I sort of everything seemed to turn for me you know that moment hearing her talk and so I love the idea that there might be someone listening to you um like you were um that, that gets some some spark or some renewed hope and so I wondered what would you what would you say to someone watching this who's maybe struggling or who maybe hasn't yet had the measure of success that they would want would you have advice I think the main writing advice that I'd ever, ever say to anybody is the only difference between somebody who's published and somebody who is not is that the book has been written. Like, you know, it's and I know that's not any big life shattering thing or anything at all like that. But I think women more than anybody else need this permission to write and you you don't need the permission to write. It's. Um, and I know exactly what you're saying as well and trying to find it's that confidence and trying to find it and what am I doing and this isn't working and it's it's trying to just get something down on the page that you can actually work with then whether it is blowing it all away in the wind and restarting again but having that moment of realization that this is what I want to do and nobody else is going to be able to do this for me so it's it's just having to find that time like this is me talking having not spend having the absolute fear of god about my second draft you know of the next book because it's just something that you're constantly battling all the time um and it's just trying to get yourself back there onto the page you can work with something on the page you can't work with anything if it's if it's not there yeah and it's it's that that's really beautifully I think put really helpfully put and also it's that thinking that rather than seeing it as a failure something that's gone before it hasn't worked to think that you won't get to where you are now you can't get to where you are next without any of that you know trusting that you are where you need to be maybe um can we ask as my final question Fiona because we're just about out of time um can I are you able to say anything about what you're working on now no worries if it feels that it turns to smoke or a tangle of, you know. Yeah, so it's, um, I got a one book deal. So basically I'm working on um, a draft now with my agent. And of course I want to stay with Louisa Joyner for eternity because she is just the most phenomenal woman and editor and everything. She's just amazing. And um, it's, it's connected in some ways with themes, but quite different. It's sort of set um, where, I'm from a sort of again imagined sort of mismatch of um where I'm from some more suburban sort of working class and um it's more about regret and lives not roads not taken I suppose and a love story that never really got going type thing <laughs> yeah I can feel it's gonna be another another tearjerker <laughs> Yeah. Um, Fiona, thank you. It's been such a pleasure um, chatting to you today. Um, I'm sure everyone listening and watching will have enjoyed it as well. Um, thank you. And thank you to the Irish Cultural Centre in Hammersmith for hosting this. That's great. Thanks, Lucy and everybody. Thank you.